Good day and welcome to the CISO Corner CISO Podcast. I have with me today, once again, my esteemed colleague from the European side of the world, Harvey Seal. Welcome, Harvey. How are you doing, sir? Very well. Thanks, Mark. Good, good. And I have with us as well as Larry Coffey. Larry comes to us from the United States and it's going to be our sieges expert today. Larry, introduce yourself. Oh, okay. Hey. Um, so I'm Larry Coffey. Uh, I work for a company called Sieges Ace. We're, uh, <clears throat> we're a division of diverse computing located in, in Tallahassee, Florida. So, um, so pretty much my background is, uh, or do you want going to go into that far at this point in time? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm doing all this other kind of stuff. No, no you, you go, go ahead. All right. So yeah, um, uh, I was with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for 22 years and played in the Sieges sandbox the entire time. Um, started off as a compliance auditor, uh, moved up to, uh, to, to working more with the, uh, the criminal justice executives across North Florida, helping them understand and comply with the Sieges security policy. And then uh, finally my, my last 13 years or so with FDLE was I was the, the CGIS information security officer uh, for the state of Florida, helping the, the CGIS director understand our level of compliance and also working with um, the criminal justice agencies throughout the state, helping them understand what all these requirements are and what they had to do. Um, also part of that time, the, the uh, eight, eight of those years, the eight final years, I was a member of the Security Nexus Subcommittee, which is part of the the FBI CGIS Advisory Policy Board, and we're going to get into that a little bit too, because that's going to help explain why we do some of the things that we do. So, well, that's right an excellent here. that that's an excellent segue, and thank you for introducing yourself, uh, Larry. So, for all those who are curious, what this CGIS thing is, Criminal Justice Information System. Larry, why don't you give us just a real short primer on what it is and why it's why it's of any concern to IT professionals like Harvey and myself? Sure. Um, um, the the CDIS world, um, Criminal Justice Information Services, um, spans the the realm of information systems supporting what's called the administration of criminal justice. Okay, so in the um, in, in here in the United States, uh, essentially from uh, investigating a criminal activity all the way through, you know, an arrest, uh, uh, a prosecution, adjudication, um, uh, sentencing, uh, you know, correctional supervision, all the way until someone is released, uh, a criminal offender is released from that criminal justice system. Um, is falls into the the realm of the administration of criminal justice okay and so you've got a myriad of governmental entities and in fact to be a considered a criminal justice agency you have to be um, a government entity um, and so uh, you've got a myriad of 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 different folks in different uh, functions that are focused on um, completing this uh, uh, administration of criminal justice. And so um, they need information systems to do their job. They need to be able to communicate. They need to be able to um, store data and track information. Um, and so uh, they need uh, they need help in doing what they need to do because they've got to be able to, to uh, follow this thing called the CGIS security policy that we're gonna, we're gonna get all in today and, and, and work through. Um, they need help with that. But there's also people like uh, you and Harvey, okay? Y'all have clients. Who are these criminal justice agencies? And y'all need to know what the rules are within the CGIS security policy, what these requirements are, so that when you approach your client, you can say, yes, we're familiar with what these are. We can meet these requirements uh, as we go through this. Because a lot of times what they will say um, uh, a client, uh, a criminal justice agency is like, we're looking for a new X, whatever X information system may be. Uh, and it needs to be CGIS certified or CGIS compliant. And then we have to start uh, working through that as to what those means and what those terms don't mean. 
because that's an important part of this particular process. So for a, uh, a vendor, and that's what these, our companies are called, um, for a vendor to understand what these requirements, so, so, so that we can meet these requirements and help our clients do their job without having to answer to uh, uh, audit issues. And that's part and parcel to this particular process. That's, um, that, 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 that's very interesting. And, and I think that um, uh, one of the things that uh, you know, people, uh, you know, that CSPs like, uh, like Minecraft, definitely interested in unpacking is the, the important people element over and above all some security. Well, that's, um, that's where things kind of, um, um, shall we say, diverge from a lot of the other processes that's out there. Um, the CGIS security policy requires a, um, a criminal justice agency to do a fingerprint-based background check on, um, of course, their employees, but also the employees of a contractor who will be supporting um, whatever service is being provided, okay? And that, that they have access to criminal justice information. Um, so the, 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 the issue that we run into is, is that there is no national clearinghouse for people. So um, there's not something that, uh, for example, uh, Mimecast can, can go to and say, hey, we want to clear our people to be able to support uh, criminal justice services. And so uh, there's no, nothing to go to and, and, and get this all done. Uh, literally, the, the, the security policy is actually focused on a agency by agency process, okay? And so, um, and so you get to a situation where you've got literally thousands of criminal justice agencies throughout the United States. Um, and, and, and for example, a company like Mimecast, if you've got contracts with multiple criminal justice agencies, essentially you have a, a process where you may have to be doing multiple background checks on the individuals that you have. So um, now, some of the states uh, have set up what they call a statewide um, vetting process. Some states haven't, okay? And so, and, it's, and it is a uh, hodgepodge as, as, as it were of, of who has and who hasn't uh, as part of this particular process. But as, as we go through this, essentially um, what, a, what a vendor needs to do is when they're coming in contact with a, a, a new potential client if it's the first time uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a given state, probably some of the opening questions are, um, do you, what, are the, what are the state requirements? Does your state have a statewide vendor vetting program? Or are we gonna have to do this on a one-by-one -one basis? That should be one of the first, first questions out the door in the, in the initial uh, dance, shall we say. Mm. So, so what you're saying is that as a vendor, I cannot go to the FBI webpage that says, you know, the, their resource, the CJ Security Policy Resource Center, that has an option for me to actually go through the FBI CJIS process with fingerprinting. I can't turn around and say, hey, I've, I've sent all my people through that and states, you know, Missouri or states you know, Texas or whomever, you know, they need to accept that. You're saying that I have to, I, I have to redo that for each, each agency that's out there potentially. Yes. Wow. <laughs> I know that's, that's kind of, now, like I said, there's some states, for example, um, um, some states that will, uh, they have, like I said, a, a statewide uh, process. So mm -hmm. you go into the state and you start talking with uh, uh, an agency, a police department, and they like, oh yeah, we have a, a statewide vendor vetting program, and uh, you'll start working uh, working with them um, to to go through this. And and the good thing about it in that particular state, once you once you complete that process, uh, essentially um, the personnel screening portion is complete. And they may have some additional. Hey, we want you to do this again in a couple of years. Okay be re reprinted. There's a number of states like that, that you may have already been screened in your state, 
But what they're going to make you do is in, in two years, you're going to have to resubmit fingerprints all over again. That's their option. And, and, here's the, and also, here's the deal. You know, for example, you could get cleared in a state like Nebraska, and you're all good in Nebraska. And then you go um, down to Kansas and like, uh, hey, you know, we're, we're cleared in, in Nebraska, kind of like you mentioned a while ago. And, and Kansas is going to go, well, that's nice for, for Nebraska. This is Kansas. You've got to start the process over again. OK, um, and so th that's probably one of the, the, the biggest uh, areas where, where CGIS and the CGIS security policy uh, diverges from all these other security standards out there is because of this particular process. And um, it's due to what's called a shared management uh, process. OK, the, the FBI CGIS Advisory Policy Board Okay. The entity that's got, shall we say, the, the governance over um, uh, the criminal justice information services throughout the United States and the and U.S. territories in the District of Columbia. Um, they're like, this is what's, what's been decided. And it, like I said, it is a shared governance okay, and a shared management process. And it's because you're dealing with 50 states and you're dealing with and, and, and ter number of territories in the District of Columbia. And they've got different um, uh, standards uh, and different laws, okay? So, you know, what may be a, a felony here in Florida um, may not be a felony somewhere else or uh, somewhere else or, or, or vice versa. And you have different levels. In some places, you have different levels of felonies. In some places, you don't. You just have felony. And so... Um, and, and that's one of the one of the things that we're dealing here with. You know, we're dealing with the United States, um, um, and each state is responsible for their criminal justice information. Okay, and the FBI holds them uh, each accountable separately for for that uh, for that criminal justice information and their criminal just excuse me criminal history record information, also known as criminal histories or rap sheets. Mm -hmm. So you have all these different things. And so this, this shared management and the shared governance uh, makes it difficult for one, for there to be one clearinghouse, kind of like you, you spoke about a while ago, Mark. So uh, it would be, you know, I've always thought that within the criminal justice community, because for them, it's just as vexing as it, as it is for vendors uh, that, they've got to go through this process all over again. And what would be great is as if there were a national clearinghouse to go, yep, he's been cleared, we're good to go. Hey, let's, uh, are there any changes we need to know about? You know, you basically you have the, shall we say the baseline set, that would be great. And then it's like, okay, do we need to look at anything extra as part and parcel of this process? But there's not. And, you know, uh, I, got, I started getting involved with the, uh, the, the FBI CDIS Advisory Policy Board probably around the turn of the century. And I always thought it would be a great thing, but it's just because each state is a little bit different. And, you know, it's that's one thing we have to have to deal with. So we're doing with two, 250 years of history. We're still debating states' rights. <laughs> um, yeah, essentially. Um, and 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 of course, I mean, you uh, you know, we, we were talking earlier about, uh, about, you know, different states and, and, and different regional concepts, you know, and, and I, I have actually sat in meetings where people were a vendor has says, well, we're cleared in, in X. And, and the Florida response was this ain't X. Okay. Um, and so, uh, and I've seen, uh, and I've, you know, when I was, uh, uh, when I was working for the Florida department of law enforcement and working, uh, in the, um, uh, in the Security Nexus Subcommittee, you know, I, I heard a whole bunch of different um, discussions. You know, for example, Florida has some of the most liberal public records laws in the country, especially when it comes to criminal justice information. Um, California has some of the most conservative um, uh, laws concerning public records laws and, and, and their criminal justice information. And so, um, there has to be a balancing act of what this what the standard is and California wants you to when you're doing business in California they want you to follow their rules and when you're doing business in Florida 
they want you to follow their rules. And typically what you'll find is, is the CGIS security policy is that, shall we say, that, that basement, that you're not going to go below that basement. You can build from that. You can make things more restrictive as you need it. But, but CGIS, um, as a lot of people call the, the CGIS security policy, just CGIS um, is, is pretty much the basement here. Mm. Okay. Can I, can I just um, unpack a little bit around the trust and assurance element? Um, from, a, from a CSP perspective, um, you know, to, to operate in the marketplace, uh, you know, most you know, cloud service providers, Mimecast is no different, you know, we, um, we create a trust and assurance narrative with our customers via um, attestations and certifications and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, so what I want to um, just you know, get your view on uh, is that, you know, is there any kind of like, if someone's going to start this journey, maybe the, you know, so, you know, some CSBs feel that there is opportunity in this space and they want to start the journey of being more attractive to uh, customers who, you know, have, have the responsibility of, uh, you know, of, of processing and holding C, uh, CJI. Mm -hmm. um, about what that base level would be. So uh, would it be SOC 2? Would FedRAM be the minimum starting point? Doesn't it matter? I, I know that your company, uh, CGS Ace, uh, helps organizations uh, like, like with Mimecast on our um, successful compliance journey to you know, CGS compliance. But is there anything else that if someone's starting this journey, they might want to consider? Well, and you, know, you, you mentioned a, a couple already Harvey, uh, you know, uh, SOC 2, um, you know, we've got uh, uh, what's, what we're seeing more and more happening, uh, state ramp is something that's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, um, I know talking with uh, uh, my friends at the FBI who will still talk to me, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're really behind the, the concept of, of state ramp. Um, they support, you know, uh, Fed ramp and uh, FISMA, uh, and, um, and, and what I would tell you is they're all good, okay? Um, we're working with a, a, a state right now, um, and part of their um, vendor vetting process is um, they want a, a copy of the uh, SOC 2 attestation. Uh, to look at as part of their that's part of their vendor vetting process. If you're if you're dealing with a, a cloud or, or or a hosted solution that's not on premises at the criminal justice agency, they want a copy of that SOC two attestation. It's it's good stuff. And what's this is going to sound um, this is going to sound kind of crass, but I'm going to say it anyway. All right, because um, I've seen it happen uh, again. Um, you know, I, I've seen entities uh, approach um, CSAs, uh, which is, uh, by the way, a CSA um, is a CGIS systems agency. It is the state CGIS agency that oversees the CGIS operations within the state. Uh, also, uh, of that, you have a, a CSO, CGIS systems officer. This is the, the woman or the man um, who is pretty much, they're the uh, they're the ones who is uh, tasked with ensuring CGIS compliance. And it's not just a CGIS security policy. There's a bunch of other um, uh, CGIS services that are out there, um, but uh, uh, they're, they're charged with this. And I've, I've seen them approach this, you know, and said, uh, a vendor says, hey, we know we're, we're SOC 2, we've all this other stuff. Um, and, and the response from them and actually the, the local criminal justice agency has been, that's good. Are you CGIS compliant? Okay. And they, they'll just like, okay, it's, it's almost as if they kind of, they acknowledge it. Yes, that's good. But they kind of push that to the side and they go, tell me about CGIS. And, and the reason why I say that is, especially when you start dealing with your customers, okay, your clients out there who are criminal justice agencies. Oh, and by the way, I'm, I may use law enforcement and criminal justice agency intertwined. A law enforcement agency is in fact a criminal justice agency, but a criminal justice agency may not be a law enforcement agency, but nonetheless. Okay, so when you're dealing with them, um, it's almost, for lack of a better term, been beat into their heads. Sieges, 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 because they are going to be audited every three years, okay? 
by their state CSA. It is going to happen. Okay. It's, it's like death and taxes. And, and, and I used to be one of these auditors. In fact, that's uh, when I first started, it was every two years that the visit uh, would occur. But uh, as things have progressed, they've moved them now to three years. So they're going to be audited. All right. Um, and they're going to say, someone from the state is going to show up and say, tell me about this, 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 and this, you know, and they're going to sit down with the CJ security policy. And, and as they're doing this, um, and as they're doing part of the audit, they're going to come and they're talking with the, uh, the Tallahassee police department. And they're going to say, um, okay, uh, you got a contract with uh, Mimecast. Yes. And I don't know if Tallahassee does or not. They probably don't, but uh, anyway. And so, um, They'll ask, they'll ask Tallahassee Police Department some questions. Well, tell us about Mimecast. You know, are, is, it, is it a hosted solution? Is it there at your data center? No, 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 it's in the cloud. And then the auditor is going to kind of, their, 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 their eyes are either going to narrow or widen a little bit because they're like, okay, here we go. We'll have a, ask a lot of questions. Were you approved to put it in a cloud solution? Uh, you know, uh, what, uh, what process did you go through it to, to get approval to before you put it in a cloud solution? And so... So back to the, uh, the issue is they are so focused and because they've been audited over and over and, and uh, their chief, their sheriff, their state attorney, their district attorney, their chief judge, their administrators, like we just got audited or, you know, or did we, did we pass? Um, uh, of course, that's gonna be the question to ask and that's technically not the, the right question to ask. Uh, but still, so, and there's so much focus on that is that SOC, yes, that's good. In fact, um, um, they'll say, yeah, that's good. But are you CGIS? Uh, are you CGIS compliant? Can you, can you comply with the CGIS security policy? So, so Larry, Larry how, how can an organization like Mimecast or Databank on our own go out there and get some piece of paper it says we're CGIS compliant because I'm not aware of an actual piece of paper that I can receive from a federal agency or any other agency that says you're CGIS compliant that we can wave in the air when, when somebody comes to us and asks us that question. Well, um, you're right. There ain't. If I use okay. my, my local uh, colloquialism there, you ain't, there ain't one out there. In fact, that's uh, what I thought. So how do we get over that? So let's so let's let's go through this to begin with because I I, I see this a, a number of times um, and I saw it you know again when I was with, as the ISO for FDLE uh, the CGIS ISO um, that uh, you know a, a a police department or sheriff's office would approach me and said hey I've been approached by um, uh, a company and they say they're CGIS certified and my response. And the response you're going to get from the FBI and from every CGIS ISO in the country, uh, I know I know specifically from the FBI ISO, because uh, Chris Weatherly is a great guy, he's going to say, there ain't no such thing as CGIS certified, okay? Right. And the reason why is the FBI doesn't have a, a CGIS certification process, mm -hmm. and the states don't have a CGIS certification process. They're busy enough right now just going out and doing audits. Uh, and making sure because um, both the FBI and the states are required to do these audits. It's not just because they're like, hey, we think it's a great thing to go do audits. No, they're required to go do audits as part of the overall compliance and making sure that, that everyone's doing what they're supposed to do, at least the, the base level. So no, there's not. And so again, uh, if someone came to me and said, we're CJ certified, my response is, who certified you and let me see the process okay. because they can't answer the first question. And if they have a second one, it's going to be like, hmm, okay, um, I, that might be interesting. But as, as along those lines, there's still, when we talk compliance, um, that's kind of a will of the wisp also. I mean, you can, it's like, eh, I really can't grab a hold of this because Let's go back to our situation with Tallahassee Police Department and having a contract with Mimecast. So FDLE comes to audit Tallahassee Police Department. They don't come to audit Mimecast, okay? They're gonna talk with, with Tallahassee Police Department about their use of the Mimecast services and, and, and what Mimecast is doing um, 
uh, that's required by the CEGIS security policy. You know, is, are you doing background checks on Mimecast personnel? You know, where's where's the where's their service? Is it hosted? Is it local? Is it you know is is it encrypted between um, the the end user and the the cloud service or whatever? And they'll go through a number of the different questions as as part of part of that. And then they'll say, okay, who else do you have a contract with? Well, we got a contract with Diverse Computing. Okay, tell us about Diverse Computing. And they'll go through each one of the criminal justice agencies. CGIS vendors as part of this process and they'll go through and so in the end let's say everything's perfect okay they don't find anything wrong with Tallahassee Police Department what they'll say is uh, Tallahassee Police Department um, uh, is we, we we didn't find any uh, any issues of non-compliance some some states will say they're compliant okay or they're clear or something along those lines you're not going to hear FDLE says Mimecast is compliant. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, could it be inferred? Yeah, you can infer that the Mimecast offering for the Tallahassee Police Department is compliant. Okay. But I always say, going back even to my time as, this, as an ISO, I would say, no, it just means they didn't find anything wrong with the, the Mimecast. Uh, and, and, I believe that if an auditor wants to go and find something, they can. Okay. Sure. Um, you know, so, uh, and, and I don't like, uh, I even go back to my time. I think audit should be actually be partial, partial training. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not one of these gotcha kind of auditors. I'm one of these, Hey, look, let's find out what the issues are so we can fix them to, to keep the information safe and, and, and keep the situation up and running because there's men and women that's standing beside the road at 3 a.m. in the morning with someone or a group of someone's that they're not sure about and they need information and they need it timely um, as part of this particular process. They need good information um, uh, to, to make their decisions uh, um, in this particular world. So anyway. So it would be- So uh, I, I'm gonna- I'm, I'm bringing it back around. Hang on, to, hang on. So I'm bringing it back around. So yeah, there is not one. However, that's where CGS Ace comes in. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to do a pitch for my company right here. So okay. A um, number of years ago, um, my my parent company, Diverse Computing, was approached by one of our clients, and we're gonna get audited. We're gonna get audited. Can you help us? And we're like, all right. Um, we'll see what we can do. And so the company kind of helped them through. Uh, not long after that, uh, my director, uh, Bill Tayton, a former uh, New York State trooper, um, and uh, he's a retired, excuse me, retired New York State trooper. That's probably a better way of saying it. Uh, whom I met, uh, he was the uh, the CGIS ISO and then later the CS, CGIS CSO for the state of New York. Uh, we met um, on the Security and Access Subcommittee as when we were doing, uh, started doing the, the security policy rewrite back in um, in 2009. So we went through this process and he retired um, uh, and they said, hey, Bill, why don't you come work? DCI said, hey, why don't you come work for us? And, and uh, we see, DCI says, we, we see this potential here that, that other entities may need help. Um, and the original focus was, was to work with criminal justice agencies throughout the country. And then he got approached by a vendor saying, hey, would you help us with this? Um, and uh, things, things started to change and, and he approached me and he says, would you be willing? And I'm like, sure. Uh, and so um, I came to work for, uh, uh, for CGS States and we, we feel that we're pretty much uh, uh, an industry, industry leader. There are, I've heard of a couple more out there, uh, but our process, essentially what we do is we sit down with a vendor and we go through the entire CGIS security policy. There are some 588 shall statements in this thing that someone's got to comply with. And so we, you know, uh, I sat down with Harvey and said, all right, Harvey, you know, and his group and said, all right, let's go through this. Are you aware of this? Are you doing this? Do you know what this means as part of this process? And we went through all this and we developed a, a compliance profile and with mitigation strategies to come back and say, okay, these are the areas that you need to work on. Okay, here's some of the things that you need to do to get there. Okay, um, so 
you know, again, we, we go through this, we feel that we've got the experience, you know, I, like I said, I got 22 years with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and an additional right now, um, uh, five years with CJS Ace. I just went from doing what I was doing in the state of Florida to doing it all across the country now with, uh, with criminal justice agencies. I'm still working with criminal justice agencies. I'm working with vendors like you and, and Harvey. Um, I'm working with states. Our company works with states. We, uh, um, um, and, and helping them, uh, we do training as part of this particular process to help them um, understand um, uh, these processes. And when we're done, we, uh, we have this thing we call our, uh, our compliance seal. Now, uh, it, it actually says readiness on it, but it's, it's, it's uh, uh, we, we call it a compliance seal. And basically it says, we feel that you're ready to meet the requirements of the siege of security clause. And we, we believe it's the only one that's out there. Um, you know, I ran into someone the other day, they had a, uh, I was working with a, a vendor and they're like, well, our competitor has the siege of seal. And I said, show it to me. It's a generic siege of seal. It doesn't say FBI, doesn't say any state. It just, it just says criminal justice information services and has an eagle. And I'm like, well, that's, that's good. And they say they're, they're always working to, to be CJIS compliant. I'm like, okay, anybody can say that. Uh, so we feel that we're, uh, we're unique in the industry and that we will go through the process. So uh, we, and we've got, uh, uh, we also um, have um, our, our, our homegrown service called CJIS Insight, which helps agencies track their compliance. So they can go in there, um, you know, when I go through and, and, and do my engagement with them and identify those. And when we're done, I turn it over to them and say, right now you start working on this um, and, and you track your compliance as to what's going on um, as part of this process. And if you want to, you can bring us back after you've worked on those issues and we'll do a follow-up as part of this particular process. So yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we feel we're about the only ones out there that's doing something like that. Uh, don't know mm -hmm. how long we'll hold on to that, uh, that niche, but we're gonna hold on to it as long as we can. Um, and we've got, uh, uh, we feel we've got a very good product and uh, um, uh, uh, we've worked with some, um, some rather large entities that are out there. So I would agree, I would agree with all of that, Larry. And, and I think what, one of the idiosyncrasies of CG's policy isn't just about being awesome at security because you, you, you can work that out. You can, you know, there are, there are guidelines, there are standards, there are frameworks out there and you can build on what you've done and you can have big demanding customers. Hell, you can even have an interface with government uh, globally, different governments. Um, but it's the idiosyncrasies that I think most organizations are gonna need that help with. And, uh, you know, from, you know, from my time working with you, I found that incredibly valuable. It's those things you simply can't Google. You simply can't find, you can read the seizures policy, it's available, but interpreting it is a different, different kettle of fish. And it's not just about security. There's a whole bunch of stuff around this. As I said right at the beginning, the, you know, the, the, the human uh, element of it. Sure. And all of these ingredients need to work together um, that, that become you know, something bigger than the sum of its parts. But if you miss some of them out, having awesome security by itself, by itself doesn't cut, doesn't cut it on the CG's front. Yeah, it, and uh, again, we're we're back to you know, you can be fully SOC compliant. Like I said, FedRAMP, FISMA, State Ramp, all these things, all the the European standards, which are sometimes I think is even more powerful than some of the uh, the US standards. So you can. Um, an entity can meet all these things, but um, especially when you're dealing with a, a, a criminal justice agency, that's going to be the key. They're always going to come back to, yes, but can you comply with the siege of security policy? And, and uh, war story real quick, uh, a number of years ago, uh, Florida was trying to move to a single statewide email system, okay? And um, one of the requirements that FDLE, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, put into the, the, uh, the RFP was that it had to be CJIS security policy require, uh, uh, compliant. And, and because I was the CJIS ISO at the time, I sat in on part 
uh, the, these these presentations. Every one of them stood up there and said, "Oh yeah, we're we're, we're CJIS compliant." Okay, um, and I mean every one. Nope, not not a problem. Any of them. Finally, the the uh, uh, the the RFP the the contract was awarded. And we started going through the process and we started talking about implementation. And I was still caught up in this particular process, you know, uh, because of my role. And um, literally, we were on a phone call, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and the FBI CGIS ISO staff with the vendor. And the vendor said, well, we don't have to comply with that. And it was kind of funny because the, the folks in West Virginia and the folks in Florida busted out laughing, which was sad uh, because we were just like, uh, that's not your call, okay? Um, you don't get to make, the, to make that determination. We're going to determine whether or not when, where you have to comply. And what we're talking about, you do have to comply. So uh, in the end, I think that was part of their undoing and the contract kind of fell apart was because they really couldn't, they, they were trying to work to it, but they were having to do a lot of things to, to make it uh, see just compliant. And that was, I have to admit that was, it was before a lot of the cloud computing uh, that we see now um, with uh, the big name uh, entities that are out there and the controls that are, that are currently in place. Um, um, things, are, things are a little bit easier than they were. This was uh, back, uh, like I said, about 10 years ago when we went through that particular process. Uh, so um, as, as we move forward, as technology moves forward, uh, I know that the, uh, the Security and Access Subcommittee is focused on at least trying to stay <laughs> trying to stay abreast with technology, uh, you know, and, and, and when, when we're dealing with the, uh, uh, the compliance world, um, if, if we could just stay abreast with technology, everyone would be ecstatic because, you know, um, we get, we're going to get off this call and we're going to read something like, oh, Drat, um, I, I haven't thought about that. In fact, one of the things, uh, I probably shouldn't. I probably shouldn't do this. I'm going to probably shoot myself in the foot by doing this. Uh, I, I'm I'm wondering um, if and how the new policy. And by the way, uh, FYI, there is a currently a security policy rewrite task force going on. Okay, so we're going to see some changes uh, in the coming year. Uh, it's going to be my understanding. It's supposed to be an incremental rollout, but we are going to see some changes. But one of the things that came to mind was, and it's not addressed directly, is the internet of things, okay? Because you've got police departments, you've got, excuse me, criminal justice agencies out there. Um, and it's like, well, are you, are you using any internet of things in, on, your, on your network, on the same network that's processing criminal justice information? And I was thinking about this, I'm like, look, I got an old house. I have a, a thermostat that's that I can control via the internet. Um, and so, and as we know, we, we see more and more uh, the internet of things is starting to get into our world. And now, even in that, even something along those lines, what, we, what I would say, and, and what I said to the, the vendor I was working with, this is what we've got to do is Sometimes we have to figure out how we take um, the square peg of your operations and figure out how it's going to fit in that round hole of the CGIS security policy, okay? So sometimes it's, it's not all cut and dry. It's like, oh yeah, you have to do this. Sometimes we have to sit there and go, you know, all right, well, let's, let's think about this. How, how, how does your application and service interact with criminal justice information, criminal justice information networks, okay? Um, uh, so that we can get there and we can say, we feel that we're, we can comply with the security policy because we're taking these particular uh, caution, precautions. You know, one of the things that I've, uh, I, I have found in dealing with sieges is what is the definition of the data um, that is considered CGIS? 
And that, that's been an arbitrary thing as well. So for example, I may deal with one customer whose responsibility is for food services in the prison system. Mm. And, and so they've come to us and said, hey, we need to be CJIS compliant. Mm. Really, you know, dealing with the food services. And mm. so in, in understanding better about how they do their job, I've learned that each, each um, inmate has, a, has all their allergies and everything listed that goes into that food service. Or another one is a, uh, is a training, an education online learning system. Mm. And the inmates are allowed to log into there. So the, their, their entire training path, every time they take a class and every time they answer a question becomes part of Siege's data that needs to be protected. One of the things I've, I've that, that's always been a little uh, ambiguous is, you know, you, in, in certain fields, you have uh, categories, like if you're in HIPAA, you have certain 18 categories that are defined as, as things that need to be protected. Is there something similar with sieges that we can point to that says, okay, it, it, the food service stuff really doesn't need to be sieges, but this particular aspect of it does, or these particular pieces of data that sit inside the database do need to be protected. Is, is there anything that we could point to that, that would take us to that level? Okay, um, so yeah. Um, so what we're gonna do is, you know, we always start with, um, you know, we go back to the, the CJ security policy itself. Um, so let me, let me read directly from the CJIS security policy. Mm -hmm. Criminal justice information is the term used to refer to, I wanna emphasize here, all of the FBI CJIS provided data necessary for law enforcement and criminal justice agencies to perform their mission, okay? So that's, that's our starting point that we're gonna to go to, all right? Now, that's in the CJIS security policy, cut and dry. Um, the FBI is coming to audit you. They're looking for, did this information originate from an FBI CJIS system? And, you know, typically you know, the, the big three is uh, uh, NCIC, the National Crime Information mm -hmm. Center. Um, also the Interstate Identification Index. That's the national system to points. Hey, there's a criminal history on this person in this state or whatever situation. And finally, the National Data Exchange. Uh, uh, index. Um, these are the three that if this information originated, if, if, if you, if it's for sure that this information came from one of these systems, it's criminal justice information. And, and they said, Hey, you need to treat this like criminal justice information. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the starting point. Now, that being said. So the starting point could be simply the fact that the individual's name is inside of one of those three and, well, and because the name's there, the things that filter down um, as a result of that? Potentially, okay. Potentially, okay. And that's, that's one of the things that, uh, um, you know, um, I bet you could find my name in index. You may, if, if you've... Uh, if you've, if you've filed a police report, you know, hey, uh, someone, you know, someone broke into my car or I saw some suspicious activity, there's a possibility your name could be in an index. Or we had background investigations conducted for government work and like SBIs perhaps? Potentially, all right, um, um, potentially, okay? So, I mean, that's, that's part and parcel, but, you know, I mean, the, just someone's name alone is not criminal justice information. You know, okay. I, can say, I can say Mark Hopped all day long. I haven't disseminated criminal, criminal justice information. If I say, hey, my friend at FDLE said Mark Hopped has a criminal history out of Utah, I have crossed that line, okay? Because I have confirmed um, that he has a criminal history, okay, in another state, and I've kind of confirmed the source. It came from someone at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, okay? So I've kind of drawn a line here. Just saying Mark hopped all day long doesn't mean anything, okay? Um, 
Now, um, hang on a second. I want to add this also because I use this um, um, and uh, as you know, as part of when we're discussing uh, these particular situations, uh, I use this. And this is a this is a quote from the current uh, FDLE uh, CGIS director. He is the CSA for the state of Florida. His name is Charlie Schaefer. Okay, great guy. Uh, worked with him for a, a number of years. Um, and so this is this is his quote. Uh, it seems a day doesn't go by without someone asking me. What is the definition of CJI, criminal justice information? Mm -hmm. As the CJIS systems officer for Florida, here is my working definition. Criminal justice information is information obtained from any FDLE CJIS system, Florida Department of Law Enforcement. He goes on to name um, um, the different uh, systems, the Florida Crime Information Center, the Biometric Identification System, Falcon, and Computerized Criminal History is CJI and shall be protected to the same standards mandated by the CJIS security policy. When determining if information should be considered and protected as CJI, agencies should consider the source of the information and not necessarily the data elements that make it up, okay? Now, so in the security policy, we've got the term saying, look, if it came from an FBI CJIS system, it's CJI. And all the states recognize that. Then you've got CSOs like Charlie saying, if it came from our state CJIS system, we want you to treat it in just the same manner. And one of the reasons why, one of the primary reasons why is because a lot of those state systems that I mentioned have information that came from the FBI system, okay? There's links in there as to, to bits and pieces of other information. And so a lot of times they go, look, we, we, we don't want to deal with the data elements. Let's just, let's make sure we just cast it broad and say, look, if it, if it potentially came in this area, it's, that's what needs to be focused on. And so you've got, you've got that bit of information. So the states are looking at their stuff, okay? FBI the states, and then we get down to, to, to locals, okay? Okay. So, and so, now, so now they have to look at in their systems, you know, what's in their system. And so, uh, you know, if you're dealing with, for example, an inmate, well, mm -hmm. for example, um, right now we can go online uh, in the state of Florida and I can access any inmate. I can tell you any, anyone who's an inmate in the state of Florida right now right. no problem okay that's on the internet all right this is not right. me you know my, our friend harvey sitting over across the pond he can do this and he can do this too a lot of states are, are like that local in florida a lot of the county jails they have that information how can they do that well it's because it's their information okay um it's not at that particular point that some of the information that they're having that they're putting out there is public record information. It's not criminal justice information, okay? So a, a local county jail, their local, hey, this is the people that were arrested over the weekend. Hey, Harry, uh, Harvey, Larry, and, and Mark were all arrested in, 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 Tal in Leon County and booked in the jail. That's local information, okay? So they can get away with doing that. When you start getting into those jail management systems like you were talking about a while ago, Mark, with the inmate records, you're going to find that there is state and national criminal justice information in those systems. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so those, those entities that are in charge of, of those systems, um, they're scared. Okay. Um, yeah. Let me, I'll just use that term. They're scared because they don't want to run afoul with their state CSA during an audit going, Hey, wait a minute. This is a this is a criminal justice information system. You're not doing any of these things, and so a lot of times they're approaching this and saying, "Yep, it's a criminal justice information system." And even the bits and pieces, the different um, uh, applications or um, uh, the different services that may not deal directly with criminal justice information, 
they paint with a broad brush and say, it's a CJI system. We're going to treat it like a CJI system. And even though all it's doing is tracking what the inmate ate at lunch, I don't care. Okay. Now, and some of the things you mentioned a while ago, um, we, you know, now you're starting to, to get some HIPAA stuff in there. Okay. So mm -hmm. you got to be, you kind of got, there's some things you got to kind of keep an eye on as part and parcel of this process. But C just doesn't look at HIPAA. That's a different standard all right. again. Okay. Right. Absolutely. So, so that, that was going to be my, my next question. I believe you, you've started to answer it. You may want to have some additional comments, but there, there has to be a fine line between what is considered a court record and a considered open record type of situation versus what is sieges type of information. So for example, here in the state of Illinois, where I'm at, I can go online in a, in an, in a program called judici.com or, or, and, and look up everything that goes on regarding a particular case. I can see how the, you know, what it was filed, who was subpoenaed, um, what, you know, what judge is assigned, what the judge rendered, or I could go into, you know, Indiana, for example, or any other state and look up my own name, my sister's name, my dad's name, whomever, and find out what type of, what, what type of, uh, you know, motor vehicle violations they may have had and so on and so forth. So there, you, what you're saying is, is that there is a fine line between what is considered a, a public record versus what is considered a CJS record, or is there not? Oh, oh, there is. In fact, that's probably one of the things that uh, that upset a number of, of of entities here in Florida. Okay, because let me give you an example. Um, again, we'll go back to Florida. Uh, that's the one that I'm the most familiar with. Florida has what's called uh, um, CCH on the internet. So mm -hmm. right now, you can go online and. Um, you can, um, if you're looking for someone that, for example, you know has a criminal history, you can put their basic demographic information that you're in there and that you know of them, and you can search. FDLE is going to charge you $25 for this. Okay, they're allowed to under Florida public records laws. And if they got a criminal history, you'll get it back. Okay, their their name. Uh, the different charges, uh, who, what's, what they were filed with, whether they were convicted, you know, just the, the whole, all the quote public record information. Now, you're not going to get juvenile information. You won't get sealed and expunged information as part of the process. You won't get um, anything like a, a multi-state offender flag or their um, state identification number or their FBI number. Um, certain things that's not going to be in that record. So, but you probably will get their social security number. Actually, I don't remember if you would. You're not supposed. I don't think you're supposed to. Um, yeah, this this one that I'm talking about here, which is very similar, which is Judici up here in Illinois, you actually do get their their social security number. Well, and as part of that particular process, that's more of a PII issue than it is a CJIS issue, and that's that's uh -huh. kind of where uh, some other things I come say, uh, that is mean, Come into play. You said that because um, uh, privacy is big, uh, okay. and obviously with ESPs, it's, it's a real big. You know, it's one of the bucket of things that you know the, the balls yeah. are around, particularly if you're a global GCSE. Well, just just because just because I've been convicted of a crime doesn't mean that uh, my identity shouldn't be protected. I mean, someone can come along and steal my identity and go out and get a credit card and start doing things in, in my name. And so, so yeah, I mean. I, that that still comes into play, but but here's the thing: that criminal history that I pulled up a while ago. Let's say it's you know when Harvey was on vacation years ago here in Florida and uh, 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 busted up a a bar because he had a little too much to uh, to uh, to enjoy the evening with. And uh, I'm not sure I'm coming out well on this podcast. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was gonna say, Harvey, do you do you want to jump off while you can? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so and let's just say, yeah, he was he was arrested. Um, 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 he uh, you know he, he he pled no contest. The judge said, all right, uh, you know, because he was in the in the clink for for a little while. Time serve, you know, you know, fine, um, uh, you know, you know, fifty hours community service, whatever. Okay. So it, let's say it's just a, it's just a, it's a, it's, you know, it's just a misdemeanor kind of thing, but it went through the process. All right, bam, there's that. 
I can pull that up. I can see all this stuff. He's not a, it's, it's not sealed or expunged. He's not a juvenile or anything like that. Pretty simple stuff. A police officer sitting right next to me on his, on his state system, on his system that's connected with the, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, runs background check and gets the same information back as I did, except for some of those other numbers that I talked about a while ago, FBI numbers, uh, multi-state mm -hmm. offender status and things like that. Um, he's gonna get back, if you look at the information, the information is exactly the same and and people go in that work in the criminal justice community go, why are you, why are we getting in trouble when it's available for on the internet? Okay. Exactly. That's because you're getting you you have direct access to the actual state criminal history database. Okay. They're going through a public record system that's not taking them there. It's going in there, getting certain information and redacting it before you're getting it back so so they're not hitting the state system they're you know they're they're up against uh, uh you know they're playing in a dmz with with data that's been redacted this cop over here she's actually hitting fdle and the fbi and the other states directly okay mm -hmm. and so that's the reason why you know it's like okay it's public record versus this is the actual criminal justice information, the national state and national criminal justice information services that you're touching with this computer system that you're on over here. And, you know, also um, I'm being charged over here on the internet. You're not in Florida. You're not being charged anything. Okay. The, your, your, your agency is not being charged anything. There's some States that actually charge for the transactions. Florida is not one of them. So, <clears throat> so yeah yeah so it's all about there's, the source of the record then well and yeah it goes back to charlie's um uh charlie's control uh, uh comment a while ago yeah it's right. where did that information come from and, and the controls in place and the siege of security policy also looks at that you know is that it, we're talking about direct access as part of the process but again um the the there is a fine line and historically, okay, the <clears throat> so the FBI, I'm going to kind of couch it this way. The FBI kind of gets the first crack at saying whether or not it's criminal justice information. Because they'll look at it, their auditors will go, this is our information. Yes, you've got to follow the, pro the, the policy. Okay. So, but if they come back, nope, we don't think it is, we don't have to worry about them. The next entity that has the crack at it is the state. They now go, go and you go, well, it may not have FBI information, but it's got our information in it. It's mm -hmm. CJI. You need to treat it as CJI. But even if they come back and go, no, nope, we don't think so. Now we move down to the local agency. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to couch the local agency as any, um, any specific criminal justice agency that's using criminal justice information for the performance of their duties and in, in support of the administration of criminal justice. When they're when they look at it, if they feel, yeah, we think it's criminal justice information, they're the final arbiter on this. Okay. Um, um, you know, they can we, you know, I, I can advise Harvey and I can advise you and say, you know, I'm looking at this, it doesn't appear to be criminal justice information. You know, what even the, the fields we're talking about, it doesn't appear to be criminal justice information. Um, it's, you know, name. Name is not criminal justice information. Home address, that's not criminal justice information. What kind of car they drive, that's not criminal justice information. You know, um, you know we, we can kind of go through, they call the police department at, at four o'clock in the morning on the 26th. That's not criminal justice information. So we can kind of go through here and we can come back to them and say, hey, we've looked at it. You can say, we brought this guy in who, who, who says he's got a little bit of experience. He looked at it. He doesn't feel it is. I'll talk to them if you want me to. But, you know, what they're going to do is they've been told a lot of times, look, it's not what, what I say. It's not what you say. It's what the CSA says. And what right. the ISO from the CSA says. And so they'll go to them. Now, I'll talk with them also. 
you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of these men and women throughout the country. They're great folks. Um, they're concerned. They want to make sure that what they're doing is right. They want to make sure that they are complying with the CGIS security policy and working with these, um, these agencies, your clients throughout the country. They want to make sure that everything's good to go um, as part of this particular process. We can talk to them. We can say, this is, this is criminal. We don't think this is criminal justice information. And this is why I've been in these conversations um, uh, with, with several states as part of this particular process. But in the end, they get to make the choice. They get to make the decision. Okay. Uh, if a local agency, like, you know, like you were talking about a while ago, Mark, if they're so, well, criminal justice information system, it's got to follow the rules. About all we can do is say, okay, Fine. Here's, Show me the rules and I'll follow. Right, the, the, here, here's the rules. I mean, we, we and, and I can help you identify what those particular rules are. Here's the thing also, sometimes, uh, and I've done this with some agencies before, is do you need to follow the rules? And I've actually worked with several agencies and come back and go, no, I don't think you need to follow the rules, okay? And here's, the, now, should you? Yes, you should, okay? It's a good standard. Mm -hmm. But uh, in fact, there's several of our clients have, have, you know, I've written testimony. Well, testimony is not a good word. I've written statements for them as part of the process and said, I've looked at this. this I've identified the data fields they work with specifically. This is the only data that's being provided to them, okay? They don't have access into the local system. The local agency is actually pushing data to them, okay? Mm -hmm. So they don't have access to the system. All they know is what they receive. What the, what's being provided to them, name, address, a time a call was made, things like that. It's not criminal justice information, okay? Um, okay, so so let's dive into that. I, I've got basically two questions, and then which I'm sure will take us a, a, a few moments, and then maybe Harvey's got a few, and then we'll probably have to start wrapping up here. But okay. in the United States, we have a, a very clear due process mm -hmm. Um due process, I guess, um, if you will. Um, so is there a point when the CSO takes alleged situations or alleged information, um, you know, is it, is it the point when somebody's arrested or is it early on an investigative process where it becomes sieges type of data on a typical situation or is there, is there some line, if you will, where it becomes that? And um, my response is it varies, okay? Okay. So it depends on what we're dealing with, all right? Um, so I kind of mentioned the, the three different national systems a while ago, the um, right. NCIC. Um, the Interstate Identification Index and Index, excuse me, and Index, uh, National Data Exchange. Pardon me. Um, and so um, each one covers a different aspect of, of criminal justice information. Um, let's start with the Interstate Identification Index. Basically, it's a pointer of crim to criminal histories, okay? Mm -hmm. right? This is the national system that says there's a criminal history on a given individual at a different state, okay? Or, or potentially the FBI. The FBI maintains some, but essentially it's a state. And convicted, con convictions, not, not alleged Negative. histories, right? Negative. Okay. It's based on arrest. If you've been arrested, okay, for a criminal mm -hmm. charge, okay, and hauled down and fingerprinted at the local jail, uh, um, you're going to have a criminal history, okay? Even, uh, even if you were found not guilty, mm -hmm. you're still going to have a criminal history. That's not going away. Now, you may be able to get that record sealed, okay, because... You were arrested one time. There's different states have different rules regarding sealing records and expunging records. Okay, um, you could potentially get that record sealed because you were found uh, not guilty. Okay, um, but part and parcel of the process is based on 
that's the beginning of this. There's there's an arrest, and this is, and and additionally, in some states, California, New York, they're ones that you know they're not comfortable in certain situations releasing information when there's only just an arrest. Okay, Florida's different. You've been arrested. It's coming out, okay, as, as part of a public records request, okay. So an arrest will will result in the creation of a criminal history, okay. So right now in Florida, uh, if I were to be arrested right now, within forty eight hours, I have a record in Index. I'm not sure. I'm not sorry. Excuse me. Uh, the uh, the Interstate Identification Index, okay, uh, because. Uh, Leon County Sheriff's Office are going to roll my prints. They're electronically submitted to FDLE. Elect FDLE forwards a copy to the FBI. They get all the information, my demographic information, what the charge was, and bam, that record is available. Okay. Um, Toot sweet. All right. So, um, so yeah. So, the, the criminal history is based on that. All right. Uh, now, different states have different rules and statutes as to how you can use that information. We're back to that state's rights thing that we were talking about a while ago, Mark. Uh, right. California, you can't, for example, you can't make uh, employment decisions, especially for a criminal justice agency, based on solely an arrest. Okay. So, uh, you know, in Florida, what they'll do is, you know, they'll, oh, there's an arrest. There's no, there's no, uh, um, we don't have a, a disposition on this, which means, hey, was he found guilty, not guilty, whatever the stuff is, there's no disposition on this. They'll go and they will attempt to get the disposition. If there's none available, for example, um, as part of a, a background check process, they're like, okay, we don't have any disposition, you're still in the process, you're denied, okay? Now, that's just for criminal history. Now we move over to NCIC, the National Crime Information Center, and everyone, they always hear about running NCIC and CSI or uh, NCIS or whatever, running NCIC, NCIC has everything. Well, no, not really, it doesn't. Uh, NCIC is also known as the hot files. It has things like wanted people, uh, missing persons, uh, stolen property and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of different things in there. Uh, some of the files in there are based on intelligence information. Um, um, some of it, uh, uh, you can track back to a criminal history, uh, but it's not the criminal history itself. It's, it's, it's information, hey, this is information about uh, an individual based on a, uh, a given situation or potential uh, conviction. So, um, and, you know, for example, you can have there could be a warrant out for your arrest, but there's no criminal history on you, okay? Uh, for example, all those, all those parking tickets that you failed to pay when you were going up and visiting the people in Chicago, Mark, uh, you know, you kept getting parking tickets, you're like, yeah, whatever. Uh, and they finally said, all right, that's enough. And they went out and got an, uh, a warrant for you. And you're like, you didn't even know about it. So there's a possibility there could be a warrant for you in NCIC, all right? Might be just a misdemeanor warrant, but there could be a warrant in there. So. It's not based on that, but typically uh, records that are in NCIC are based on some type of criminal complaint or intelligence information, okay? So, and, and so that's associated with some type of, of report, okay? But it's not a criminal history, all right? It's, it's, it's kind of along those particular lines. So that's, that's NCIC. And then we move over to INDEX. And I kind of mentioned it a while ago. Uh, INDEX came about uh, after in the post 9-11 world when we're like, we had information, we started looking at it and saying, oh man, we've got information on all these people. Why didn't we connect the dots? Well, the information wasn't in, wasn't in the Interstate Identification Index, okay? It wasn't in that. It wasn't in uh, NCIC. It was in local record management systems and local computer-aided dispatch systems as part of this particular process. So the FBI started to, to work on a system and, and it came about which is called INDEX, National Data Exchange. And essentially what it does, it takes this 
these different information systems throughout the country and kind of brings them together. So law enforcement can get, okay, let me see if I can connect some, some dots here with some of the things going on. I mentioned a while ago, we three could be in index. Okay. I'm, um, you know, I've made, uh, 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 you know, I've called the police before and said, Hey, you know, uh, uh, giving them some information. I saw this happen. Uh, um, someone broke into my vehicle or something along these particular lines. And so, um, and so that goes into their computer aided dispatch system or their, or their record management system. And that information could be forwarded up. I, I haven't done anything criminal, okay? Uh, but as because it's part of that information system that's coming together, um, sometimes they can use these different, um, different systems to, to tie things together on a national level. I know that um, um, every advisory policy board, they, a lot of times they say, hey, this is, these are some, this is some of the cases that were solved using index as part of this particular process. So you've got all these different information systems that are out there. So usually, usually they are not just someone goes, you know, I don't like Mark. I'm going to put a warrant out on him. Okay. I got to have a warrant to, to be able to, I'm supposed to be able to have a warrant to be able to do that. Could someone misuse a system? Um, they probably could, but if they found out, boy, they're going to be in a heap big, a lot of trouble with doing something along those particular lines. Uh, um, uh, we're talking about jail time. So, um, but you, you've got all these, these, these systems. And so it's not just um, someone sitting down going, hey, I think I'll do this. Uh, these systems have certain controls to be able to put information into them so it can be shared. But once it gets in there, you know, for example, let's go back to my situation a while ago. I called the Tallahassee Police Department and said, hey, um, I came out this morning. I forgot to lock my vehicle. Um, someone rummaged through my vehicle and stuff like that. Okay. And so, um, and I think they took, I don't know, something. I had, a, I left X in there, let's just say. And they come out and they take a report and she, you know, the officer asked me a lot of questions and I fill all this information. And so it goes into their record management system. Okay. Locally, it's just my information. Hey, this is, you know, Larry Coffey, and this is where he lives, and this is when he calls. This was a complaint. This is this is his statement and stuff like that. It's just, just local stuff. Well, potentially that could make its way up to the index. Okay. So in Tallahassee, it's local information. But if for whatever reason, um, let's say I'm under investigation for or or something down in, I don't know, Orlando. And, and they run my name in index and this record pops up. Well, they got that information from index. They didn't get it from Tallahassee Police Department. So sitting in Tallahassee, it's not really criminal justice information, but then retrieving it from index down in Orlando does make it criminal justice information because they retrieved it from that national system. Right. So uh, did that help any or did I confuse things that no. much? No, actually, it, it makes a lot of sense um, and, and really kind of provides some clarity to, to where we're going here. Hey, Harvey, did you have any questions, any uh, further questions you wanted to uh, throw in there? Yes, thanks. I, I, just a couple of things. I just want to finish off quickly the, the, the privacy elements that, mm -hmm. that we unpack quite deeply. But uh, And it's not for you to come back on that, Larry, because we've talked about this before. But it, 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 it's you know, one, of, one of my learnings around this was... So you, you've, got, you've got seizures, you've got security, you've got those elements, and then you've got local privacy law uh, that you layer on the top of it. So when you're talking about PII, that's why some states mm -hmm. can have that approach to it and some aren't. Uh, I just thought I'd finish off that little bit because that, that was, uh, that, 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 you know, that's uh, forward in the mind of most CSP insurance people, uh, to, so, certainly at the minute. Um, so there's just a couple of things, uh, and I, I'm going to ask both questions, and, and maybe you can combine to, into into the same into the same answer. Okay. First is about metadata. So uh, as you know, um, most software systems use data about data in order for the service to operate, and sometimes that metadata contains components of the data. 
Uh, often it's metrics, it's around you know, what the data is doing and where it is and what class it is and that kind of stuff. But sometimes it contains elements of the data. I want to uh, get your thoughts on a little bit on that. And the second question was, um, most global uh, cloud service providers of which Mimecast is one of them, we have, we have folks all around the world. So there are some quite specific requirements um, about that. Uh, and so if you could talk a little bit about the access requirements and really there are, anyone can be put forward for authorization, but ultimately it comes down to people in the US having the, you know, the, the, the highest number of points, if you like, they'll get them over that authorization bar. The highest number of points. I like that. That's pretty cool. All right. So let's start off with metadata. All right. Um, so essentially, um, and, and uh, I always uh, go back to the, the CGIS security policy, you know, uh, when I'm, uh, when I'm working with folks and, uh, and uh, going through this, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people uh, years ago when I was, uh, when I was there uh, at the, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, people used to, there was, there was this, there was this rumor going around that I used to sleep with the CDS security policy. And I'm like, uh, no, no, I don't, I don't sleep with the CDS security policy. I, do oh, have yeah. I have a copy next to the bed, but I don't <laughs> sleep with it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Miss Mary wouldn't, Miss Mary don't put up for that kind of stuff. She's like, yeah. So, um, and so, I mean, um, one of the things, just a sidebar, I always talk with, with clients and say, look, or, or everybody, if you have to do CGIS compliant, get your copy of the policy, either hard copy or even electronic copy and highlight all the shall statements because that's gonna take you where you need to know. And again, just going through it and highlighting it helps you understand some of the requirements um, that are out there. So I don't know everything in it. Uh, I, I like to know that I have an idea where I can find things. And I always like, um, after having to do uh, uh, a deposition, uh, one time, oh, uh, luckily I only had, ever had to do one. I had a uh, I had a lawyer tell me you use typically a lot. Now, yeah, I learned a long time ago never say always and never. That's going to get you in trouble. So, all right. So let's talk about metadata. All right. Uh, you, you talked about uh, about that. Um, you know, as we know, data metadata is essentially data about data. And so there were some some questions regarding. Uh, metadata, and it's, it's specifically addressed in the policy, it says metadata derived from unencrypted, key, key word here, unencrypted CJI shall be protected in the same manner as CJI. Okay, that's, that's, that's step one. Okay, so when we're dealing with, when we're dealing with metadata, uh, uh, if it's from unencrypted CJI, that, that, that's, our, that's our first line in the sand. This information coming in, is it encrypted or unencrypted? Well, it's, it's encrypted. All right. We don't have to play, we don't have to play with, with the, those particular rules. We've, we've already drawn that line. It's encrypted. All the metadata derived is from encrypted data, CJI. All right. Now, I, I'm not going to begin to understand whether or not it's, it's encrypted or unencrypted as part of the particular process, okay? Or, or how even encrypted metadata can be processed. I don't know. All right, uh, but that's going to be our first line in the sand as uh, as we're dealing with this. Okay, so it still needs to be treated as CJI. Okay, and the the next step is and shall not be used for any advertising or other commercial purposes by any cloud service provider or um, associated entity. Okay, so. You know, you're allowed to use metadata to support your client doing their, their administration of criminal justice. There's nothing that says you can't do that, okay? It's just you, excuse me, that Mimecast and DataBank can't take that data and go, hey, guess what? Now, our, our criminal justice uh, customers, we know this, 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 and this. We can provide you better services. No can't go down that particular road. However, again, however, if it's supporting your, your client, yes, you can do that, all right? Uh, but again, it's, it's important 
um, that it that it does um, does those um, like I said supports what they're doing in the administration of criminal justice. You got to be real. Now let me let me stress here again. We, we got to be real careful and, and walk a lot, fine line here um, because some would say, oh well. Uh, we're, we're helping the system by doing this. We're not offering any services because we're looking at the metadata flow here. All right, you need to be, you need to have your ducks in a row, as they say, before you go along those particular lines because you don't want to run afoul with the security policy in that particular area. So again, um, and I bring this up, um, again, the, uh, back to the metadata, the, the encrypt, unencrypted, CJI. So if we're dealing with metadata that is considered from, from CJI, now we have to follow that requirement that pretty much says that information has to remain in the United States. Okay. The security policy is very adamant about that. CJI, even in an encrypted state, must be housed in the United States. Okay. You can't, uh, you can't put it on a server over in the UK. You know, and in some cases, you might not be able to even put it in Canada, uh, although the policy does make a, um, an exception for that. There's some states I know that won't said, nope, we don't want our data in Canada, okay? And it's not because they think Canada's bad, it's because Canada won't do a full background check on certain people in the data center, okay? Uh, so that's pretty much about, does that help with metadata? It does for me, thank you very much. Okay. It does. So let's talk about the, the global aspect, okay? Um, basically, the security policy says you gotta do background, a fingerprint-based background check on anyone with access to unencrypted CJI, okay? Um, so what does that mean if I've got a developer in um, um, Johannesburg, South Africa? How am I going to do a background check on, on, on someone in Johannesburg, South Africa? Okay. Um, there's not a state in the country uh, that has um, a, an agreement with South Africa to do, to submit fingerprints for them to scan their system and go, nope, uh, he's all clear. The, the connectivity is not there. And even along those particular lines, you know, people say, well, what about Interpol? Well, Interpol typically only has information about people whom a host country wants or has, has issues with, okay? So unless they're looking for that particular person, if that country is looking for that particular person, Interpol's not gonna have their information. Um, so um, again, um, you're not gonna be able to perform a fingerprint-based background check on someone living outside the US. Therefore, the states are not going to allow uh, a foreign national living outside the US from accessing criminal justice information. Okay, so that's just, that's something that, that, that has to be taken into account. Um, we, we wanna talk about foreign nationals living here in the states. Um, that can be problematic. Um, um, there is a, Department of Justice rule that says any non-U.S. citizen with access to a DOJ system uh, has to be approved by, I can't remember if it's the FBI or Department of Justice, okay? Um, so, I mean, that, that can be problematic. However, I know that a number of states have approved people. Um, a lot of states, a lot of companies have individuals that are foreign nationals that are here in the US on a work visa or something along those particular lines, they've got valid immigration status and they have been approved to access criminal justice information. So, um, but typically uh, if they, shall we say, leave to, to go overseas or something along those particular lines, <coughs> excuse me, um, um, they're like, no, no access outside the US. Indeed, that's, so that, I mean, that's perfect. Thank you very much, Larry. I mean, it's, that's, uh, that, that's our understanding of it, and it's good to hear your, your views on that. Uh, I, I don't have anything more for, for Larry in this session, Mark. I don't know whether you do. Great. Well, then I will just, uh, I'll wrap it up. 
you know, it's been a, an absolute pleasure to sit here and talk with you for the last uh, 90 minutes or so. You are a wealth of information about sieges and a lot of things that I learned. And there's really two key takeaways that I have from this entire conversation. One is that uh, the CGIS security standards are out there for us to download, to review, look at the shall statements. Um, those are the important statements for us to review as, as cloud security uh, professionals. And then the other one that I really picked up on is it, it, because there could be so many differences from state and local entities, always ask a vendor that's coming to us for, that wants to be compliant with CGIS who the CSO is and have a conversation with that CSO to find out what their standards are or what the CSA standards are that's, that's associated with that CSO. That's, so That's a good point. I, need, I want to interject something. Yeah, typically, go ahead. Typically as a, as a company, as a vendor, they may not talk to us, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, they typically don't. What they'll do is they talk through their local agencies, okay? So basically right. what you've got to do mostly is you've actually got to go through, if you want to have a contract uh, in the state of Florida, you've got to, for example, Tallahassee Police Department. You start talking with them, and we get to the point where uh, potentially the information will, will flow from the CSA through Tallahassee. And then if you get to a certain situation, and I've seen this happen before, the, the, you have the contract in place and that your client says, hey, can, can data bank sit in there? That's who we've contracted with. We've contracted with data bank. Can they sit in this conversation so they can hear what's going on? And they'll usually say yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So typically the CSA, the CSO won't talk with you directly. Uh, but if, but if your client says, can my vendor sit in, they'll say, yes, they can, which is good because we don't have to play the, the telephone game. You hear it straight from their mouth instead of like, okay, I heard it from this person who heard it from this person and passed it to you. And we know how that ends up. Right. So, exactly. Um, anyway. All right. Um, so sorry, great. Great. On that one. No, no, you're, you're fine. That that's a great piece of final information. So, uh, so with that, Larry, again, thank you for joining us. And I uh, look forward to potentially having future conversations or, or even sending some of our customers to you to have future Ooh. conversations about, about sieges and how to, how to become uh, this, uh, this nebulous compliance. How's that? <laughs> um, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty good. I, uh, and, and I go ahead, I wanna toot our horn for just a second. We're, we're recognized in, uh, mm -hmm. um, at a, at a national level. And uh, in fact, we, we actually have contracts with CSAs to help them do their job. So yeah, we, we're, we're coming along uh, pretty good. And I think uh, um, you know, we wanna help, uh, we wanna help folks, folks. And you know, the, the great thing that I always say is for example, you contract with us for once, you got us for life. You can always call me and say, what is this all about? And if it's about the security policy, we'll talk about it and I'll explain it to you. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, thank mm -hmm. you very much. All right, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure and on to the next time.